Hey, everybody. Welcome to Challenged Athletes Live. My name is Bob Babbitt. Our next guest, the world record holder for amputees for the marathon with a 237.23, the legend, Marco Cicetto, joins us. Marco, how are you doing? I am doing good. So, Marco, growing up in Kenya, how many kids in your family? My dad had two wives. 20 kids, 11 from my mom and nine from the other lady. So that's why you got so fast, just trying to get dinner. Yes. <laughs> Growing 20 kids, were they all in the same house? No, we had two separate households, but within the same area. So we were intermingled every day. So when you finished, you did two years of almost like a, a junior college and you were starting to teach. Um, and then you got an opportunity to go to University of Alaska in Anchorage. What did you know about Alaska when you took that scholarship? Uh, nothing. I knew that it was a school that I was going to go study. That was it. I didn't know anything about Alaska. I didn't even know where it was on the map. And what you're getting a scholarship to go there, but it's expensive to go there and that's not covered. What did your parents do? to help fund your trip? My dad was a mason. He had his shop, a carpenter. So he sold his shop and some of his cows for the air ticket. It, because to come to the US as a student, you have to go to the embassy, pay embassy fee. You have to pay some other fees called the service fee right. that pay the government that they use, they technically you paying the government to take care of you. And when you get there, we get to Anchorage, what, 2008. It, what did you, did you get there in August or September? And what was the weather like? It was August 13th, very clear sky because, because we got there at night, 8.30. But it was not an ordinary 8.30 for a Kenyan kid. It was 8.30 that looked like a midday in Kenya. The sun was up in the sky. And when did you first see snow for the first time? Uh, around November of that year, 2008. And what the heck? On, just some white stuff falling from the sky. Did you know it was falling from the sky? No, initially I thought snow would be an overtime accumulation of morning dew because that is what I had experienced in Kenya. How long did it take you to adapt to all of a sudden, this is a, a totally new world. You've got snow, you've got cold, you're wearing all sorts of layers. You, you had none of that in Kenya. To be honest with you, Bob, I don't think there was a time that I got used to that. I had to just tell my mind, this is how this is going to be. And there was nothing to train my body that, okay, it's about to get so cold, so be ready. When it was summertime, I liked it. And then it's wintertime. I don't like it, but it's wintertime. There's nothing else you can do. So you have immediate success as a runner, right? You're male athlete of the year, 2009, 2010, All-American, uh, 5,000, 10,000 meters. Your cousin William comes to join you uh, over there. And could you tell that he was having struggles dealing with the cold and the, the dark? No, no, there was no sign that he was struggling. In fact, we were having so much fun. You know, we grew up together in Kenya and imagine this young man away from home, enjoying life in Northern hemisphere. We were really having a lot of fun. So there was no red flags or anything about what he was going through. One day he calls you and wants to chat. And then yes. after you finish work, you came over to chat and what did you find? Uh, that the house, the apartment that we lived in was locked from inside and we couldn't get in. And yeah. then all of the, and the other roommates that we shared the apartment with came and each one of us was starting to give some accounts of William having wanting to talk to them. And it kind of was like, wow, this is odd, but there was nothing suspicious about it. it we thought maybe the kid is still in the library, but it never happened that he was in the library. We had to call the police, but then they said, oh, you know, if there's nothing really suspicious, let's wait until tomorrow. 
The following day, the police shows up, broke through the window, and then they just immediately turned around and said, things are not good. William had hanged himself in the bathroom. And you, you almost felt guilty, right? Like, even though there was not really anything you could have done. You know, they got in a you? feeling of guilt. You know, somebody had tried to reach out to you and then you told this guy is normal. They, you know, that human accountability, like maybe he had something that he really wanted to tell me. And had I, you know, the, had I done this, maybe this would have not been the result, even though there is no way that we could have proved that that would have been the case. So you went through depression though, after this happened and you were put on antidepressants for a while. Did, did the antidepressants help? Was you still struggling? Yes, I was still struggling. And I felt like things really started getting so hard on me after I took the antidepressants for some reason. I don't know what it was, but it never did what I thought it would do. Things just started being so, like some little things grew up to be big things in my life that I couldn't even manage, even though I tried to hold myself together and push through. So November 6, 2011, what do you remember? You went out for a run and what happened? I had taken some antidepressants and went for a run. And the last thing that I remember from that run was when I woke up and the moon was shining through the trees and I was covered by snow. Luckily, I was under a tree. So my upper body was under a tree, but my lower extremities were exposed. So I was totally covered by snow. And at that time, my mind was very clear. I knew I was in a wrong place and I needed to get out of there. And you'd been in the snow for 56 hours? At the moment when I just came back to my senses, I didn't realize how long I was there until I got to a hotel lobby. And the guy who was at the lobby asked me where I had been for 56 hours. He basically asked me, where have you been for three days? And I was kind of like, what do you mean? Where have I been for three days? And that is the last conversation I remember about that run. Yeah, you left on November 6th and they found you at 3 a.m. when you staggered into the hotel on the 9th. So three yes. days, and you don't remember a thing of those three days. Mm -mm, nothing. Wow. So you end up with frostbite. And at first, weren't you more concerned about your hands than you were about your legs? Yes, because when I was taken to the hospital, which I don't even remember what happened between when I got to the lobby to the hospital, the, a doctor asked me, what I was feeling or how I was feeling. And I said, my feet are okay, but my hands are so painful. So he again asked me, so you don't feel any pain in your legs? I said, no. And then he said, mm, that's not a good thing because pain is always a sign of life. And I said, I knew it as an athlete. Yes, it's so painful, but then you're enjoying it. So yes, so then that was when all the trouble began. They amputate your legs. And yes. had, did you know that you might be able to run again with prosthetics? No, the only thing that I was just thinking about is how am I going to navigate life with a fancy wheelchair? Because that, those are the, that's what I had seen on the streets, people on a wheelchair. So I was just thinking of myself on one of those. When did you put running legs on for the first time? I did put running legs on May 21st of 2013. At around that, five. Was that down here? Where was that at? That was up in Alaska. I had, I had a representative from OSA come to Alaska and introduced me to one of the uh, employees at OSA, who yes. ended up Rook, who Brooke, connected. Yes. Yeah. And they sent me some application paperwork. I did apply and got a running leg. So 
no, on that day, uh, 2013 was when I got my first running flex run. What did it feel like to be out running again? You know, there are some things in life that we really don't associate with sometimes. I never thought that there was an association between sweating and running in my life until I had that flex run on and I ran, I don't know how many times around the truck and I started sweating. And I tell you, that was the greatest feeling ever in my life. I don't even remember the greatest time of my life running as an able-bodied athlete, but I remember it as a, a challenged athlete. Yeah, I, I remember watching you on the track running in 2013, uh, just gingerly running along with your prosthetic legs, but you had this huge smile on your face. It was, it was almost like, okay, I get it now. Maybe there's a purpose to what I've gone through. When you went to, you go to New York City Marathon, and that's going to be your first marathon, right? You're a 5K, 10K guy. How did it feel to run? And did you have any idea how fast you were going? No, I didn't realize that, you know, I needed to pace myself the whole thing. I just thought, well, I am a good athlete. I'm a long distance runner. I'm going to just crush the thing. And until I hit mile 18, that's when I realized that I've been running for 18 miles. But I ended up finishing it and it gave me a lot of hope that this is something that I can do, given that I finished it as a rookie. What's fascinating to me is that November at New York City Marathon, you run 252. Then you go to Boston in April of 19 and you run 242. And that's you break Richard Whitehead's world record by 28 seconds. Then you go to Chicago the same year, 2019, and you run 237.23. I mean, you are breaking barriers that no amputee has ever broken before. Do you, do you feel that? Or in your mind, or you're just out there running? You know, I don't feel that. I'm out there running. And... The reason I really don't feel that is because of the kind of limitations that is set on people with disability. And me being able to do what I am doing is not all about me. I had a struggle as a, you know, a disabled athlete trying to figure out what I really wanted to do because, as you know, the Paralympics don't have anything longer than a 400 for my kids. Right. So, I said, I want to use this opportunity, one, to show that given the opportunity, given the platform, a disabled person can do great things. They just need that opportunity. Just like CAF believing in me and giving me the option to be able to run again. So this year, for our exceptional athletic performance from CAF, you are going to be winning that award. What does that mean to you? You know, it's something that I was not expecting that I would get. But one, I'm grateful for that award. And as I accept the award, I want also us not to focus so much on me as an accomplished athlete, but focusing on the future of disabled athletes. I have three kids, Bob, and it's very difficult, very challenging to tell them no. Imagine being a parent to a disabled child who wants to run and insurance says, we are not going to pay for a running food because it's a luxury. Imagine that. What, how are you going to convince your child that, you know what, honey, it's going to be okay? You're not going to run and play with your friends. I want to use this award to push more for insurance company to understand that it's not a luxury for a kid to play or for somebody like myself to run. It's part of 
our human spirit. When you run 237, do you leave that feeling, okay, that's as fast as I can go? Or do you see yourself potentially running in the 220s? I am seeing myself potentially running in the 220s because I, you know, there's something that I always discovered after my education. I realized the amount of power that is in us, everything that we need. And this is kind of like a literal explanation of everything in us that can help us succeed is in us. Because even today, I have never had a feeling in my head that I am missing my legs. I can still wiggle my toes as we talk today, Bob. That gives me that clear understanding that everything that I need is with me. You've been to the OSER CAF running clinics, the amputee running clinics. How special are those? Those are very special moments in life because I have seen people that in our normal day-to-day -day life, without having interacted with them, you would think these are people that are living a miserable life. But when you interact and see them, you will realize that these are people who are living with a purpose in life. They really know what they want to do. They have a mission to fulfill in life. What's your happiest memory, Marco? My happiest memory was one of Ebo kid, an Ebo body kid telling her mom, I want a leg like those kids, the physically challenged kids. And then I realized this is a good place to be. And I felt too being at home and also felt that I have a responsibility as a human being to make someone's life better than my own life. When you look back at everything you've gone through, what was the lowest point for you? That moment when I couldn't do anything for myself. I was not, I was not in a position to even get myself a walking leg, a running leg. But then, all of a sudden, without even me doing much of a hustle, I had a running leg and a walking leg. Then I'm thinking, how has this been made possible? Then I remember all the people that always, with the little that they have, make that donation to CAF. Fa your favorite CAF memory? Um, was when I was running that 10K during the fundraiser. And, you know, they say these are the challenged athletes, but we, the challenged athletes, or the people who are having more fun and just kicking everyone else on a run. So it kind of changed my perspective that the limitations that we've set or the way we see ourselves is a perspective. It's how you perceive yourself. The disability itself, I think, is not missing a foot. I think the greatest disability is not using your foot for the purpose that it is intended to be used for. Marco, you are the best. I, I could chat with you all day long. I love your energy. I love everything you bring to the table. I can't wait to, to be at the race the next time when you run at 227. <laughs> Take another 10 minutes. But the key is, Marco, you, you run 237. You know, small increments. Go down to 232, then 228. You know, a couple minutes at a time so you can keep getting bonuses. That's the way it's supposed to work. But then when you have a coach and they tell you, run your race like you don't have another one coming you end up running a 227 then you're like oops i don't think i'm gonna be able to run a 223. i love it marco thank you so much for joining us on challenge athletes live it's always such an honor to get to chat with you thank you so much for having me bob this is challenge athletes live my name is bob babbitt check us out next time thanks everybody